Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. We have a very special guest this week. We have Andrew Petcash joining us. If you don't know Andrew, go on Twitter and look up Andrew Petcash because he puts out the Andrew Petcash newsletter. And in this newsletter, he breaks down uh, all the stuff between sports and business, whether it's an article about how Steph Curry became a billionaire or it's talking about college players taking advantage of NIL deals. Um, we dig into all of that during our conversation on this week's podcast. Um, Andrew played D1 at Boston U. We talk about that, talk about his parents being uh, college athletes, talk about him playing tennis in high school. We also talk about NIL deals, picking agents, um, staying in college versus getting drafted and going to the second round, and the future of sports, NILs, et cetera, et cetera. This was an excellent conversation. I uh, really enjoyed Andrew and what he's doing out there. So feel free to uh, you know share this one with people that might be getting into the college game um, and want to know more about NILs and the sports business world. So thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And now, Andrew Petcash. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Andrew, welcome to the show. Corey, thanks for having me, brother. Hey, you become one of the most prolific voices in the world of sports business. Business. And your newsletter now has over 24,000 followers. Um, what was the moment where you thought, you know what, I've got something to say about this topic, and I think other people want to hear it? I would say about six months ago. I was really just writing and, you know, be friends and family, kind of like, oh, it's pretty cool. And uh, that's when some companies and, and some people started reaching out and trying to either, you know, selfishly, they wanted to get featured or they wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, okay, this is a little more than a hobby now. Uh, let me see how I can actually do some more with it. But it's it's been a fun journey, and it's the journey that that's the fun part. Obviously, I have goals with it, but that's just there's stepping stones along the way. What was the one story though that you first that first interested you in this topic? So it was the first story. So NIL fascinated me from the beginning, and and the major one was the Gator Collective. They were the first NIL collective, NIL trust to come in and basically collect money to pay players and use it through like endorsements. And that was kind of the first story where I was like, yo, this is super fascinating. There has to be deeper stories across all of sports. And that's kind of how, how it got started, but it was a great intro. And, and it's funny, like that was the first NIO collective. So theoretically I was kind of like the first one, like picking up like, yo, this is going to turn big. And now every power five school has one. Right. Who knew? Right. It's like you're getting in on Bitcoin early. Um, no, no. So what like over the past six months, like where did you start featuring these articles where you ended up getting all these all these followers to your newsletter and social media? Yeah, the, the biggest help has been Twitter. So just putting out threads, especially on athlete investments. It's always been fascinating to me, especially over the last decade with Curry and LeBron and Kevin Durant. And um, I'm putting out one tonight. Um, I'm not sure if this podcast is live, but on Clay Thompson. Uh, and it's just like, yo, these guys are so much more than just ball players, or, you know, they, they have s these whole ventures on the side, like they're pure businessmen and investors and they have cool teams around them. So like kind of the, the actual finances. And that was my degree at BU really interested me to go, okay, who are, I played basketball too, but I was, more than that now i know these guys are the same and, and girls as well you know what are, what are they doing and how are they doing it yeah who's been the most famous person either like or retweet one of your posts uh probably gabrielle union um <laughs> dwayne wade's wife she has i don't know she has a couple and i didn't even i didn't even recognize it i don't i never really get starstruck or anything with any of that stuff but my mom was like, yo, Gabrielle Union, uh, she like sent me a text. She was like, yeah, I think Gabrielle <laughs> Union just retweeted your thing. And I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, he, she was like, he has 3 million followers. You might get you might get some good, good traction. I was like, I hope so. We'll see. Um, yeah. So you started on this just, just as a hobby. Did you really have any idea it was going to take off like this? No, nah, I, I, had, I had zero clue. Um, and uh, I mean, we could say it took off, but I, I have – 
obviously goals with it. So mm -hmm. to me, it's far from where I want it to be, but it's just taking it step by step and enjoying it and having these conversations and, you know, asking people what they, what kind of stories they want to see. Like I've had people, a lot of my stories are like people, they just send me a reply email or a DM and they go, Hey, have you taken a look at this? It seems like this could be an interesting breakdown. Um, even the story I wrote today about just like TikTok and how it's working for athletes and how brands are doing it. Like that was just a company that they wanted insight on how they should work with athletes. And I was like, well, I can tell you, or I can just write about it for, you know, all everyone else that reads it. So I was like, let me just do that. So that's why, uh, you know, I reached out to you today about getting on this podcast because I read that TikTok article. And for those who haven't read it yet, I highly suggest checking it out. But you mentioned a football player from Elon and a mm -hmm. gymnast from LSU. Correct. Two people I'd never heard of before. Programs I don't know really anything about. And once you laid out kind of their uh, endorsements, the amount of uh, followers they have on social media just blew my mind and let me know that, you know, whatever level you're at, if you've got a personality and a story, you can monetize it in today's day and age. hundred percent. Yeah. The athletes are so much more powerful than they realize. And that's the best part about all this. And I, and I didn't get into the article at all about this, but it was just getting a little lengthy and I'm always cautious of like how much time people have to read these, but they, I don't know their full situation deals, but I'm like, they, they should be shareholders or own some equity in these companies because I mean, they're the perfect promoters and, and we're starting to see athletes do that more where they're going, okay, yeah, I'll take a marketing fee or an endorsement fee, but I'm going to grow your company. Let me like be a part of that growth as well and not just be so transactional. Um, and I don't know if Livy or John have, have done that, but we're starting to see that with more athletes. That's more of a take that the pros do, right? Correct. But we have had some college athletes do it uh, recently as well. Uh, Sedona Prince, uh, Oregon women's basketball player. She signed with this company, Riff. They're like an energy drink company. Um, and she was like, yeah, I'll, I'll take your money to like endorse the, the product. But I enjoyed drinking this beverage as well. Like, let me be a part of it. And let me add on some business savvy beyond and my connections beyond just the the strict social media post or you know endorsement video um which which is awesome that, that's the stuff that i'm fascinated in is like them actually growing the companies not so much the endorsements yeah because not all the companies are going to make it either so it's going to be interesting Correct. in a couple of years to see which one of these deals were good and not good and you always mention here's a post idea for you you mentioned um and this is coming right off the cuff here but you mentioned like steph curry's top investments yeah, you know, Clay Thompson's best investments. You know, it'd be a good post is here's investments that went wrong. Mm. Because I'm that down as you, as you talk. My cousin uh, Brad Miller was in the NBA 14 years, and my dad helped manage uh, his his investment portfolio. And nonstop, he would get hit up by this guy wanting money. And mainly, it was restaurants, which we learned is a no no. You never want to invest in a restaurant. And two, yeah. you know, you might have an unsavory character put a proposal down and my father's always like, cool, we'll look into it. We just need your social security number first to do a background check. And these guys would all balk because they did not have clean records. And that was, um, you know, he retired six years ago. So we're talking the past 20 years before it got into the NIL world. But mm -hmm. it just seemed like if you were a scammer, you just needed to, to get an into an NBA locker room and you could fleece guys for a lot of money. Um, yeah. So I guarantee you, you know, you look at the Antoine Walkers, you look at the Allen Iversons, other guys out there, there's, there's thousands of them that have made bad investments. I think that could be also a good stumbling block for people to see and be, hmm, I don't want to make yeah. that same mistake. Maybe I want to follow the Stephs, the Durants, the Clays. Correct. Yeah, no, I agree. That's that's a great line. And, and the media does cover a lot of that stuff. And so I'm always cautious of like, yo, I want to portray the good side. But to your point, I think you can flip the – you can – you can I can story tell the narrative in a way that's like positive of like, hey, this is what they – they did and why it went wrong. Here's, you know, ways that, that it works better. Uh, one of the, we're, the one thing we are seeing is NFTs, Web3. We're starting to see some NBA, mostly NBA, but probably athletes at all sport leagues get into some dicey situations there where they've bought into projects and then they, what's called like a rug pull, where they basically, they own so much of the token and they sell, it just drops the price drastically. And uh, I know one of the players for the Sacramento Kings did that and he made $2 million, but 
all his fans that don't make nearly as much money as him lost thousands. Um, and it's just, it's just a bad look. So we are seeing that a little bit in the, in this new tech revolution, probably coming over the next five to 10 years. And that was a great post you did on that story too. And, uh, yeah. but that player had no intention of ripping off his fans, but once again, people need to know, people need to put on their big boy pants too. And know if you're investing in this stuff, it's very speculative, right? Correct. You got to be ready for something just to, to fall out. It's not, it's not like a T-bond or something like that. Yeah. And I, even be fascinated to talk to, I think, would you say your uncle or whatever, just about how it's even changed from, you know, when he was in it to now, because I, I get to talk to a lot of these financial advisors and people that work with these athletes. And it's always interesting, their takes, because they're very lawyer like um, in how they handle their athletes of like, yeah, we can put stuff in, in venture capital or startups or angel invest, but it, it becomes a liquid and like, very quickly where you're not, you might not see that money for, for five years. Um, even if it returns a lot, like it's, it's like gone basically. So, uh, the strategy is definitely changing. And I think more athletes, so they're making more money. So they're being a, a little riskier with some of it where they're like, Hey, I might get a hundred X investment. If I make one of those and three others lose, I still won. Well, VCs try to get one out of 10, right? Yeah, that's exactly. the math. Exactly. Uh, here's one thing I always have a, a, a concern with. If I'm, if I was an athlete, I always play the game, Andrew. Like, if I won the lottery, like, you know, what would I invest in? What would I buy? Mm. You know, it's it's just it just keeps me going on the road when I'm getting tired at night. It, I can fantasize a little bit. But actually, young men do hit the lottery when they get drafted into these leagues. And to me, the most challenging part of it all would be picking the right agent, and then picking a business team you can trust because we see it about every other week some athlete or some movie star gets fleeced mm -hmm. and it's either because this person was nefarious from the get-go or these people did not check their finances or even if they did check them did they get the education in college to even know what they're looking at yeah the whole that whole world picking your team that's why lebron james is fascinating to me is like his team was all his like guys from the beginning and like calling a spade a spade i think they would all admit it too like they weren't the smartest people right at the beginning and but they did almost everything right and so i don't know if there's other people i'm sure there's people behind the scenes that were pulling strings that were at least guiding them the right way but that whole story is awesome rich paul and all those guys maverick carter and them like really all becoming true like business moguls i mean lebron just became a billionaire apparently i mean that's that's awesome but pulling back just one step a couple of the guys I played ball with at Boston U this past year, they're doing NBA workouts and all that. And uh, picking an agent was like to them, one of the hardest decisions they had to make. Now it's a little different. They don't go and get the cream of the crop, but that might even make it harder because now there's even less like actual knowledge and people that work with these guys that are at a little lower agent level or however that hierarchy works. Um, so yeah, athletes, that's, that's a tough decision. And now it's happening younger and younger, you know, now we're having high school guys that need to make that decision. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's need for, for education and the right people throughout. You know, back in 1998, uh, I was a sophomore in college and my cousin, Brad, who played in the NBA for 14 years, he was playing for Purdue and they were playing the first round in Chicago, the NCAA tournament. I flew out for it and the dad, Brad's dad wasn't in the picture. So my dad kind of helped, because Brad's mom was his sister. And uh, we went to visit Mark Bartlestein in Chicago. And Mark was an agent and he specialized in like big white guys and kind of into the first round draft picks, right? He, had, yep. he, he found Kurt Warner, all right? Okay. Uh, he got Evan Eschmeyer, like one of the biggest contracts for a guy that never produced in NBA history. And I remember going to his office when we interviewed him and uh, I didn't, but my, I was sitting here and listening. And uh, Mark Bartlestein um, ended up getting Brad over his 14 year career and $90 million. And this is my cousin who I grew up with, who was a farm boy from Indiana, $90 million. And he was a good player, but you need an agent like that who knows how to structure contracts for a certain player. And we interviewed some other people and this was the right fit because the agent and player have a, have a relationship as some people have seen in entourage, not that it's all like that, but it, it's very important. So, um, and now there's so many guys out there too. It's just, to me, Andrew, that's just, that's the scariest part is who do you pick on your team and who do you trust? And when you talk about high school players getting agents and college players, think about how the, all the bad advice people are getting now, whether it's high school players 
or college players who are transferring based on their support circle. I think two thirds of the advice that people get is bad, about one third is good. Um, so those are the same two thirds that are advising the same people on who to get for their financial team, their agents. So it's, it's not, I think you're going to see, unfortunately, a track record of more bad deals happening and money lost from now until infinity. Yeah. And the money's only getting larger too. Uh, I mean, I was talking with an agent the other day and like, we're going to have the first billion, like LeBron became a billionaire, right? But that, a lot of that's because of his Nike deal and some of the companies he's built. We're probably going to actually have over the next 20, 30 years, players that make a billion dollars in NBA contracts alone. So like, I mean, that's, that's kind of insane. Like sports is just growing so fast and I, I love to see it. I mean, I want sports to be huge, global. I think athletes are some of the, the best peak performers. I mean, why do all companies want to hire athletes? It's because they're basically our modern day warriors. And uh, that's why I loved like my experience playing so much because anything I do now, I go, there was nothing harder than trying to go play and, and you know, produce and be a good division one basketball player. Like that was like, and, and I'm actually curious, I want to get into this next on your story a little bit, but like I passed up on going to Army West Point and having like not only the D1 basketball, but also the military aspect. But I still felt like mine was still very militaristic in a way, just the way college sports is structured. So I'm just curious a little bit. I know you went to like Air Force, correct? Yeah. Um, and just a little bit more about that. What do you want to know specifically? Because I could spend five hours talking about it. <laughs> I just want to know like, how it's like you think it's different or how it shaped you like differently because I go dude my life was like this like a two completely like right now I want to be sitting here having this conversation with you I'd be at Fort Bragg or something and because I'd be serving my five years post West Point so it's just interesting where like I felt like I still did a lot of the same stuff but like it wasn't military based it was basketball based um yeah. Well, when I talk to kids about prep schools, you know, two great prep school options are Fork Union and Hargrave, and they're military. And a lot of kids are worried about that structure. And I say, look, if you play D1 or any college level, uh, it's going to be structured. You have early morning workouts, you're going to have study hall, you're going to have individual workouts, you're going to have team practice, you're going to have film. Like, it's just a schedule. Um, and mind you, so I picked Air Force because I was D1 or bust. Um, the only schools recruiting me were military academies, and I had to go to their postgrad school first to even get considered to go there. So I had five members of my family before me, Andrew, play D1. So I, I just, I had no doubt I was going to play D1. So when kids reach out to me and say they're D1 or bust, I get that because mm -hmm. that was me. Now I was six, seven with three, seven footers in my family. So I got recruited potentially on me growing to be that tall. So I called myself the white David Robbins. And I said, Hey, I'm six, <laughs> seven now, but I'm going to grow like my dad uh, five or eight inches in college and be a stud. Well, I haven't grown Andrew since 16 years old. I'm still six, seven. So um, the only schools that could take a chance on me were military academies. So yeah, my mom was an English teacher, Air Force was engineering school, right? So I struggled there. Um, I didn't like being told what to do. I'm being told what to do on a daily basis. And truthfully, I wasn't good enough to play D1. So I was struck, you know, I played four years of Juco ball. I played one year at the prep school. Uh, we played a JUCO schedule, and I played three years at JV. So I played on the JUCO circuit in the Midwest for four years, you know, four times to Dodge City, four times to Colorado Northwest. It's like Bull Durham. And at the end of it, yeah, I had a job, right, as an officer, which was going to be great for a resume, but 9-11 happened. So then I had to deploy to the Middle East. So I tell kids, like, look, I, I get you want to play D1. And I talk to them about there are certain D1s that are you don't want to go to. I'm not saying Air Force and Army are one of them, but there are schools in the bottom of the rpi ratings that have bad academics no history no fan support you're gonna lose you have no alumni network like is that worth it or should you go maybe to a better fitting school that might have a different number behind the d right and i tell kids like i, I went to war ultimately for d1 like would you do that if you're an english kid would you go to an engineering school and struggle every single day of your academic career you know, I almost got kicked out for a couple of military things. I was on probation a lot. Like my five years was really, really tough. And I could have gone to a D3 school. Plenty were recruiting me or NAIA, played, taking courses I wanted to take and maybe had a good time. But that's what I needed to do. So, yeah, was it was it regimented? Absolutely. I mean, we would take five minute breaks at night and just be like five minutes. I'm going to sit here and just do nothing before I got to start back up learning about nuclear engineering. And it was, uh, it was tough, but 
I met the best people I'll ever meet in my life. I know I can accomplish anything getting through that place. And um, it's a great sense of accomplishment, but I didn't play one single D one minute, right? I did all the work everyone else did. It's like, it like being a walk-on. So I also can counsel kids on, hey, if you want to be a walk-on, I know exactly yeah. what that's like. You better be ready for it. So long answer to your question, but yeah, the structure was there, but it, it was a unique, tough experience. And West Point recruited me too. And I knew if I graduate from this place, I'm going to be in a tank. And at least Air Force and Navy, you can be on a boat or behind a computer screen unless you're flying and much safer. So I always recommend to people, look at Air Force, Coast Guard and Navy, if you want to do Marines or Army, just assume you're going to be on the front line somewhere quickly. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's fascinating. I love, I love those kind of stories because I was like that close. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's wild. Uh, and timing-wise, is a lot different for you too, especially with all that happened, like you said. I think it would be a little different today where I'd come out and there's – I don't think there's that much going on, but – Oh, not that uh, much going on. Shoot, there's a war in Ukraine. There's there's Taiwan potentially. You never know. Yeah. You just don't know. That's you don't thing. know. Yeah, but I guess but, it kind of leads. I was gonna say like to the next thing. I want your opinion on this because I wrote about. It. I know you shared it and you you enjoyed it. Um, was about the, and I'm I'm losing some details now because it's been a couple <laughs> of weeks. But essentially, the military possibly funding full athletic scholarships for not just the military academies, but non-revenue generating sports throughout college, where, you know, you're a soccer, men's soccer player at Indiana, and the military will pay you to go to Indiana for four years, completely free, normal college experience, but upon graduating, you have to serve for whatever it is, or, I mean, they haven't worked out all those details, but I'm just curious, like, if you think that will work, what your thoughts are on it. Cause I think it's a fascinating idea that could potentially, you know, come to fruition uh, based on the people I've talked to that are kind of working on it. I love it. I love it. That's what ROTC is, Andrew. I mean, ROTC, you go to a college, you wear a uniform one day a week, you take some classes, you do like one week in the summer and then they pay for college, but you have to, you know, owe them a couple of years as an officer afterwards. So we're already doing it with ROTC. Our government uh, military budget is so big, you could throw this under the recruiting budget, which they spend billions on recruiting every year trying to get kids. And uh, so to me, I think uh, it's, it, it's an absolute no-brainer. And for folks that don't know yet, yeah, the military would pay a kid uh, his tuition, but they have to owe time afterwards, just like a military academy, just like ROTC. And yeah, and guess what, too? That can also be marketing. Like, hey, the starting fullback for um, you know Virginia, uh, he's gave up his scholarship to someone else to make their team better. He is being paid for by the U.S. Army. He'll be an officer. You know, people love those kind of stories because you hear them all throughout the Army Navy game every year when that game's televised. You know, oh, this kid's going to go special ops, and this kid's going to be a pilot, and this kid's a Rhodes Scholar. Um, I think it's great for marketing too. So, absolutely, I think I think that's a neat way to do things. Yeah. And talent wise, like I said, like the college, even for me, like it's very structured. It's very similar to a military in a way, minus any of the actual military components. But it's like I could have graduated from BU and gone right into the military and you have to learn some things. But it's like I would know the structure. I have to wake up a little bit earlier. You know, I'd have to wear a little bit different clothes. But other than that, it's not like a terrible amount is, is different from a typical college athlete. Andrew, when I got into the military, my five years active duty, I did desk jobs. I ran an office and uh, I was an executive officer, which means I was the right hand man to a colonel that ran a base. So I'm doing office work. I'm organizing stuff. I'm, you know, I'm the, the filter that can go see him and see the general, right? So that was an office job, right? I ran that, the crew beneath me. And then after that, I was a project manager on a $10 million um, air traffic control upgrade. So yeah, that's stuff that translates great to the real world. So just because it says military does not mean you're going to be out there shooting a gun right. uh, in a foreign land. I mean, there's so many support jobs out there. And a lot of those translate to the real world to where when I was getting ready to get out, headhunters nonstop were calling me like, hey, do you want to make six figures going to this corporate job? Or do you want to you know, manage a Home Depot and, and start at $90,000? Like they love officers because one, you don't get phased because you've been through too much, a lot. Two, you... Yeah you know, you can handle discipline and getting things done. And three, you've led people 
It's exactly what corporate America wants. So to me, it's a no brainer. And if you can do that with like, look, you can become an officer without going through the academy, right? The academy mm -hmm. was the most brutal way to become an officer. If you want to become an officer in any of the branches, you just need a college degree. And then you go through OTS, which is like 12 weeks of a light basic training and bam, you're an officer. Right. And you could do that right now if you wanted to. If you get bored with the, the pet cash newsletter, you can always call up a recruiter. They'll take you. They'll take you. Yeah. Right. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah. No. Nah, and I was just curious. I didn't mean to get off topic if we did. There it is all, no topic. We, we pick whatever yeah. we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, it, it's just that stuff is super fascinating to me um, because it's such a mix of athletes are warriors and warriors are obviously warriors too so it's just like um it's an interesting mix of of things going on with that whole space if you have someone uh, as an officer that's played a team sport i mean being an officer it, it is like a team sport because you're in charge of people you got to rally people you got to you know lead people in different ways just like you would yell at some teammates and encourage others it, being an athlete's a perfect transition to the officer world right it's not as technical as you'd think it's more about managing and leadership but let me let's get back to you now one of the most fascinating topics you wrote about was saint peter's run to the elite eight can you tell people that haven't read that article like what kind of financial windfall that was for the school oh it's absolutely insane you know how much money and not even money just like media free media attention that you bring the school from that run uh, I don't remember all of the numbers now. I'm sure I could pull it up and kind of refresh my memory a little bit, but I know like they're just merchandise sales. They sold more in like one week than they sell in an entire year. And not only did they sell more, they like four X'd it in, in one week. They, they obviously get paid from the actual NCAA for advancing rounds, but that kind of goes back into the conference as well. So the conference gets boosted also. Uh, because they get more influx so all the other teams get a little payday too so that's why teams always root for for especially in the the lower leagues with one with one team um, about three of the players signed pretty decent nil deals and then uh they all left because yeah. <laughs> because of nil and the transfer portal and because coaches you all you need is one good little run and a high major will come calling and so like even shaheen holloway good coach goes from, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand at St. Peter's to $2 million at Seton Hall where he played though, which is cool. So obviously he's going to yeah. take that job, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and then for the school, none of their admissions reports came out yet, but I, I looked back at like Florida Gulf coast when they had their, I think it was 2013 elite eight run, maybe when they beat like Georgetown and all those teams. And, uh, their admissions is still up like comparative to 2012. It's still up like a thousand percent. Like it, it like really, I mean, I never heard of it before then, but I still remember them and I still know, Oh, that school's like, I heard amazing and it's on the coast. So I'm sure the same thoughts go through other people's head. And that's why they've chosen college there. Fun fact on Florida Gulf coast. I've had two clients this year. Some of my clients are already um, before they figure out prep school, they apply to colleges right? Just because yeah. that's what they're going to do. And then they figure out prep school and they decide to do that. But two of my kids this year got accepted to Florida Gulf Coast and both were from, they were like, oh, I got into Michigan, you know, uh, Brandeis and Florida Gulf Coast. And I guarantee you the only reason that is, is from what you just said, because of that run 10 years ago. Yeah. Why else would anyone outside of Florida or outside that area code even apply if it wasn't for that? Yeah, actually, that's kind of funny too. Now I think about it too, two girls from my that I went to high school with ended up going there. So that would have been, I don't know, five, six years ago. So I was like, kind of like still really close to that peak yeah. where they were probably freshmen in high school when Florida Gulf coast had that run. So that was probably in their mind of like, yeah, that's cool. So, so yeah, I mean, March madness and just college sports in general, if you can have some, an upset, a big win, a March madness run, like you're going to benefit not only monetarily, but like the whole school is going to benefit from merchandise, admissions, media attention, recognition. Uh, I know alumni money at St. Peter's even like flowed like mm. in like crazy where now everyone like now they want to give money. Like they, they want to be <laughs> involved with it, which, uh, yeah, that's what that's what winning breeds. So props to them. It'll be interesting to see if they can 
keep it going. Usually those are, those are short lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is this NIL stuff for college? Is this a bubble? Is it going to crash or is it going to get even exponentially bigger? I think it's just going to keep getting bigger. The, What's the worst case scenario on all this? The worst case scenario is the NCAA tries to like get too involved and they try to be the power broker that they've always been. Uh, the second worst thing that could possibly happen is that, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people don't think this way, but I think if you allow payments to come from schools and I know California is trying to work around this. So it will be interesting to see, but like, if you're going to pay, you bring in antitrust, you bring in title nine and it's going to try to be, make everything too equal where well, that's mm. not the reality. It's like pro sports. Steph Curry gets paid 45 million because he's Steph Curry and Jordan Poole is really good, but he's a rookie. So he gets paid only a couple million. You got to earn that money. You got to earn that right, especially in sports. So to come in and say, hey, this guy's been a three-year starter. He's going to have a chance for Heisman next year. Yeah, he deserves a couple million in NIL. He doesn't deserve to be paid equal to the freshman walk-on, walk, like, long snapper. Like, and I think that is how it could happen if it comes through schools and it's like that setup. So I think the collective setup is like a loophole essentially, but I think it's also the best thing because it's like there's no it's like free where you go yeah i'm gonna pay the top guys and i'm gonna go get the top guys elsewhere or girls and uh you know if you're not worth anything you don't bring anything to the team you know you might not make anything tough luck you still probably have a full scholarship this could be the final straw that breaks the camel's back and leads the power five conferences breaking off right they're gonna get too good i think personally I uh, I think the only chance, and I've been trying to tell the guys at BU, which, you know, I can only tell people that have done the same thing for so long, so much. But like, if you don't start to raise money and try to go and get top players, you're just the gap is just going to keep going. Now, if you're fine with hopefully still winning the Patriot League and going to the tournament and getting absolutely murdered in the first round. Okay, that's cool. You still made the tournament. But if you want to have any chance to like be a St. Peter's or make a run and do something cool like that, you need at least one or two players and you have to pay them most likely. And you only need a couple hundred thousand dollars to do that. And Boston University, come on, they're the endowments, billions of dollars. And the alumni is strong and really big. Like you could you could go do that. Uh it wouldn't be it wouldn't be too too hard. And you wrote that about Ivy League a few days ago, right? Uh, yeah, I, I used Ivy League just because it was a better gauge and, like, thing. But it really works for any mid-major. St. Peter's could do it. Florida Gulf Coast could do it. But I tell you what, the Ivy League, I, you, you, I've been saying that for months now, and I'm glad you hit it on the head, is that I've had kids in the past who were middle-class kids who were being recruited by Ivy Leagues, and they're like, we're not going to qualify for financial aid. So why would I pay 60000 a year to go there when I can go to a Patriot League school for free? and then just get my what master's at an Ivy, right? I've had multiple kids do that. So now, just like you mentioned, like if I'm an Ivy League with the, with the billions in endowment fund and just wealthy alumni who love their sports, my gosh, are, are they starting collectives at Harvard? Because there are kids that would play for Tommy Amaker, want to get that degree and want to be in that alumni network and get paid. Like, is that happening right now? From my knowledge, it's not, but they know about it because they're smart. A lot of these guys, and especially if you're Harvard and Harvard's been good without that. And they do get top guys that, that they find ways to get financial aid and bring them in for full scholarships. But imagine those role players are on full scholarships and those top guys are getting paid. I mean, dude, I would, it's just like, that's like the win-win of all world. Like Stanford's cool. Duke's cool. Kentucky's cool. But it's like to get paid to go to Harvard and say you went there, like you can't beat that. Like that's like, especially with athletes now, and we're talking about the business of athletes and they're investing in stuff and doing all these cool ventures and starting their own companies. Go to Harvard and play. I guarantee you when you step like from me and you and from experience, like when we talk to someone say, oh yeah, we played D1 and we played Air Force BU, good names to them. It goes far. No one remembers like if you played, if they were good, et cetera. So it's like, yeah, you can say, oh, I played at Duke. Okay, that's cool. But if you go to Harvard, it's it's literally equally as good, but even better 
because of alumni um that that if i could like be younger again i would be like yo harvard yeah i know they got their full scholarship for that money because that's why i didn't go ivy league like you said i had ivy league stuff but i was like i'm gonna go to the patriot league because i get a full scholarship we had ivy league letters come into me too my dad just said we're not gonna qualify so just not that i was good enough but just like just take them off your list yeah here's exactly. a crazy thing you just mentioned there like i i didn't you know i didn't get one minute of d1 action but i was in a d1 program and what's crazy about the basketball world is that actually carries more cachet than if i scored three thousand points at a d3 school it's not fair but that damn d1 like moniker just goes so far and um yeah that's why i think that's why kids are like d1 or bust you know i don't blame them at all i mean that's what so i played at Boston, my younger brother, Dan, he's currently at Binghamton in New York, D1, American East. And then my youngest brother, Joey, kind of COVID the whole happened. And he was a good player. In a normal year, he probably has a chance to go D1. But he was just like, there was nothing just because of the transfer portal and all this. And he's like, I'm just going to college for regular because he's like D1 or nothing. And I was like, that's almost even better. I, I think there is there is value in going and playing other. But me and one of my teammates were talking about this one day. Because a lot of guys now, so even at BU and Binghamton, a lot of guys transferred from D1 and now they're going to play D2. But they play D1, so they'll probably always say, even though they might play more years at this D2 now, they'll always go, oh, I played D1 at Binghamton. But to, you would like look back and be like, dang, I could have played. Because in the moment, you think it matters so much to like, oh, I want to be the high scorer and play so much. But it's like this carries you 10 times farther, in my opinion. It's just In certain circles, it's, right? In most – yeah yeah and yeah i agree in our uh, in our basketball circles like you, just, you know you you play in d1 it's uh yeah it means more than like like i said the three thousand point d3 guy in yeah. some circles right it's yeah. not right but, yeah. at all but it's just the reality yeah, but you're also like if you meet someone you're not gonna be like oh i, I played at you know a d3 school and i scored three thousand points you're just gonna say oh i played basketball at blank blank mm-hmm. and then they may or may not look you up and it you know Usually, unless it's like very basketball specific conversation, people are just like, oh, he's a good athlete and he played D1 and he played at this school, which is a good school. That's usually how it seems to go in my opinion, from my experience. When I hear someone say that, I just know like, oh, you put in a lot of time. Your college experience was weight rooms, travel, tutors, up early. Like, I just know like you put, you went through a lot to get through college versus just being a normal college kid. Correct. And the, the D1, the pressure at D1 is much worse too than other levels which let me ask you this since you played d1 what is something about being a d1 player that maybe or being in a d1 program that maybe people don't know about that they should and by people i mean like high schoolers that are d1 or bus like give me an insight of like you might want to know about this that no one talks about yeah I and mean, i could give you a bunch of things the first thing that would immediately come to my mind is like there are politics out you know there there are heavy politics especially at that level because you have to keep in mind, just like every kid wants to probably play D1, every coach wants to be a head D1 coach. So if you're an assistant D1, you're close, but you're not quite there. But the way they kind of structure things too, and this is kind of what happened to me, but you have a coach that recruits you. Well, that they have, you know, at least in basketball, you have four coaches, they recruit you, but there's carryover. So, you know, there might be the one guy that recruits California and the other guy recruits the East Coast. And they each get a point guard. Well, they're both going to be vying to the head coach to play their guy that they recruited. And unfortunately, the guy that recruited me left right after my freshman year. So, like, he was always vying for me, pushing for me. But that kind of, you know, disappears once that guy leaves. So there's a lot of politics as well between assistants where they want their guys to play because they recruited them and they want them to look good. Like, hey, I recruited that kid. And that also carries to them hopefully getting coaching jobs. So that'll be, I don't know if that helps anyone too much, but it's just like, it's just an interesting thing that most people don't know about the dynamics of that stuff. And that makes me think about walk-ons, right? I've had two kids in the past. One was a two, both were 2000 point scores in Kentucky, right? Both went D one and both sat the bench because of politics. And you just can't play a walk-on over a scholarship player, Right. And they could not sit the bench because they're like, I'm better than these guys. This is not fair. And they both transferred down to NAI programs, which was the right fit all along anyway for them. 
but that's the thing. Like, you know, I've got, I got four kids, four of my clients this year walking on D1 and all of them. I said, do you know what you're getting into? Oh, I'll earn my way into a scholarship or plan time. And I said, just like you mentioned the politics, I said, you might think that, but you have to know that might never happen. And you have to be okay with this. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, is to play off that we had a walk on come in and he actually did prove himself and start to play. But when it came, they told him two years walk on two years scholarship. Well, those two years were up and he's going, where's my scholarship? And they go, we don't have one for you. Well, he's two years out of really high academic school, Boston University. He's probably going to start the next year, but he's going to pay full tuition. You know why? Because the school, the coaches, they're going to get, they're going to take another kid on a scholarship because they know he's not going to leave and he didn't leave. And so they got like an extra scholarship in their eyes. And it's like, we don't care that you produced for this. We don't care that we told you two and two. And they, uh, he ended up, well, now with COVID, some things happened. He ended up getting one, but he still paid a whole extra year that he didn't have to. And it's, it's a dirty like, bit. Yeah. Families yeah. will come to me and say, like, this coach said this. It said, it's a dirty business, unfortunately. We picked a dirty sport, Andrew. Not that we knew that as kids when we started playing. Yeah. But it's a dirty sport, unfortunately. That goes back to NIL. This is a good segue right here because – we're seeing now where schools are can't officially promise, but they can say, hey, you come here, you're going to get this amount of dollars. And then a kid gets on campus. And he's like, where's my money? And, and the guys that said that are like, well, what are you talking about? And then there's a bunch of distrust from day one. What are your thoughts on that? And is there a way a player can protect themselves or they can't because schools can't make guarantees or can't do contracts before a kid gets there. So explain that a little bit and how yeah. best to protect yourself from a situation like that. Yeah. Well, first off, and we mentioned this a little about people around you, but you have to read these contracts, especially anything with NIL. If you do, but can I anything, stop you right there real quick? You can't technically get a contract before you attend the school, right? They won't be labeled as a contract. Okay. They'll be like an endorsement deal, but they're, gonna be a contract oh i see so theoretically it's, yeah it's, i should have okay. clarified that but yes it's really a con everyone knows what it is i just call it a contract now because i'm used to saying that <laughs> okay. um but it is like theoretically an endorsement deal oh you'll show up to their charity oh you'll go you'll post on social media for their you know whatever it is but it's a contract in its essence but you got to read it or you gotta have people that lawyers that read it or someone because they'll put they've been putting funky stuff in them where it's like yo if you don't you know, do this, meaning it could be like stats wise, your contracts void. We, or there's other things I've seen, like they own your social media, essentially where like, you're not even really going to be able to make endorsement deals because the collective that's paying you. And this is obviously for the higher end guys as well, but I think it's still relevant and interesting. They, they could own your like social media, essentially where they, they can say, no, you can't post that. You can't work with that company, blah, blah, blah. Um, so you gotta, you gotta read that stuff. I would say that those are like the most important things is like, know what you're getting into and also find brands that align with you. If you're, whether you're a big time athlete signing with EA sports, or you're a smaller one signing with the local restaurant, like does this match who you are? Because if it doesn't, you know, that's what I try to do. Even with my newsletter doing sponsors is like, does this, I mean, I get stuff all the time. I'm like, yeah, I could, I mean, I could take their money and it's, it's nice on that side, but also like my audience is going to be like, what the heck is this? Like, this doesn't even make sense. Uh, so I've always been cautious of that myself is like, I'm sometimes in similar situations of, of athletes of what I'm building, um, that they're in, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. Uh, it's cool to see these guys get paid, but I just, they just need to be smart. They just need to be smart. Without mentioning names or situations, have there been people that have gotten screwed already in the college world? And if so, can you give an instance of like what happened? Yeah, I wouldn't say so much. We haven't seen a ton, but there's been things, and this is where I think it's going to go. And this is where guys will probably start to get screwed this year. But, and I was mentioning of like the stats and the contract, like you got to produce to get that. Well, I think the way NIL is going to go is when guys come in, you know, right now they're going, oh, we'll give one, five, we'll give a million dollars to a five-star recruit. Why? Like, there's no basis for it. They're just throwing around money, hoping that guys will stick and land. And that's why we have some of these funky contracts 
I think where it's going to go is they're going to – some of the top guys, they'll get decent money to come in, but it's going to become performance-based where, okay, you might get $50,000 to come in and play at Tennessee or Alabama or whatever, but then, like, they'll re-up stuff where now, okay, these were our top players. The next year you're going to get $2 million. I think it's going to become way more performance-based, and that's why I think transfers are going to be the highest-valued players until this one-and-done rule is, is over. And this one-and-done rule – is killing the model because it's strictly free agency. And until the NCA removes that, which is still, I think, two or three years left, it's going to be, you know, we might see really high guys. I'll even use like Bryce Young. Like he could just leave Alabama next year because he's like, maybe he's like, oh, I'm not quite good enough for the pros yet, but Alabama's only paying me a couple million and Texas A&M will pay me even more because it's not really going to hurt his draft stock or anything. And he can go and make more money. Um, so I think it is going to become performance based, but we need that one and done rule or want like the, the transfer. Uh, I might, I was saying that wrong. The one and done, I was meaning the one time transfer where you can just transfer and play right away. Uh, more so than the, uh, where it used to be, you have to sit out a year. That That's what I, I was meaning to say. I might mean one, one and done. That was the wrong terminology. So your opinion is we need to bring back the sitting out a year. Yeah. To, to control the free agency that's going around now where guys are just poaching where really Caleb Williams shouldn't be able to leave Oklahoma because he's following more money at USC. He should have to sit out a year if he wants to do that. Yeah. So now the collective goes, do we really want to pay this guy to sit out a year? That will like make things more manageable. But well, coaches do it all the time. So that's yeah. like, the, that's the flip side to it where maybe they should be able to move around. If coaches move around for more money, then so should players. I know. It's, it's, it's tricky. You should sit out, but then coaches do it, so why can't players do it? But I tell you that, what, this all trickles down to high school and the prep school world, so it affects me and my clients because there's less kids getting recruited now because they are go these coaches are going after the transfers. Um, so it is absolutely trickled down. But um, that, that's fascinating. That, that Well, let me ask you this. There are people now I've heard, like a Drew Timmy, who yeah. are going to stay another year at Gonzaga because he can, in theory, make more at Gonzaga than he would as a second-round draft pick. So in theory, we should have more guys stay in the college game now making more money. Is that right or wrong? Correct. Correct. That was going to be my next point beyond performance, where they're going to pay more in performance than just coming in and your star ratings or whatever. But also – the NBA is now, and even the NFL, they're in competition with college sports because Drew Timmy in a normal world is going to the NBA. Oscar Toshiba in a normal world is going to the NBA. With NIL, they're going to make more in college. They get way more publicity. They're going to sign bigger endorsement deals. Drew Timmy and Oscar Toshiba go to the NBA now. No brands want to work with them. They forget about them. But at Kentucky, they'll still all work with them. So the, the NBA, NFL, they have competition now in college sports, and that's where the Power Five could possibly flip away and they become the semi-pro model, and, and no one really knows what's going to happen. So it's just like, hey, it's like a little movie. Let's watch it unfold, you know, give our opinion here and there. But not, no one really knows uh, where, where it's headed. But, uh, yeah, I mean, guys coming back is, is kind of – is. Well, I, I saw this the other day. I think you'll find this interesting. They say being a second round draft pick in the, in the NBA is like one of the worst things that can happen because you, number one, get locked into a team. You don't get a good deals. Or if you're actually an undrafted free agent, you have you can like kind of pick the team that might be the best fit for you or you have the best trajectory or you can take the best deal. So I don't know if you have any insight on that, but I saw that. I was like, maybe that'll be something I'll break down further. Yeah, so my cousin, that's exactly what happened to him. So he was going to be a mid-round uh first round pick out of Purdue and um, he didn't have the best work ethic in college, both in the classroom and uh, so I've got some concerns late. So he didn't get drafted uh, the first round and then the second round either. And that draft night, he was, he was crushed, just disappeared, just crushed. And um, his agent Bartlestein was like, relax, we're going to send you to Italy because guess what? The NBA is locked out right now. So while all these players are just sitting in limbo waiting for the season to start. He's over there in Italy training, working his butt off in a pro league. And then Charlotte picked him up on like a one month contract. And he broke some record his first couple of games where he didn't miss a sh like his first 15 shots. Wow. And he was backing up Derek Coleman and Eldon Campbell. And 
it turned out to be the best thing for him in hindsight. At the time, everyone's crushed because there are plenty of names from that draft that you never heard of. Corleone Young, Casey Shaw. My, my cousin brings up Casey Shaw. He's actually a friend of mine. He's an assistant coach at Grand Canyon. But my cousin's like, you know, effing Casey Shaw. You know, like I was way better than him in high school, college, and, and this and that. And these MFers picked him over me. But that also fueled him to take it out on every team that passed him up. So he played throughout his career with a chip on his shoulder, which led to him getting the big contract where he was the only white American to make the all-star game two years in a row. Wow. I mean, he was Jordan's teammate, the last all-star game he played in. You see like Durant, uh, not Durant, a uh, Garnett, Iverson, Jordan, Vince Carter, my cousin, Dirk Nowitzki, Shaq. And it's like, this is unreal. Like how did you from Kendallville, Indiana end up in the all-star game and it wouldn't have happened had he gotten drafted. Yeah, that's so, awesome. uh, Things all work out in life. We're looking big picture now after seeing it fold right. out. But back to Oscar and Drew, I mean, think about Kentucky's – so my uncle, my dad's baby brother, played in Kentucky from 79 to 84, right? So I've heard some stories from him about how things work there behind the scenes. Now you don't need behind the scenes anymore with these collectives, Andrew. So, like, rabid fan bases like your A&Ms, your Alabama footballs, your Nebraska footballs, your Kentucky basketballs, it's going to get out of hand because you've got donors there with itchy fingers that might even do things under the table still oh, yeah. and just say, hey, come to my, my son's graduation party. Here's 5K. And, you know, it's not technically legal, but like no one's going to be really coming after that now because no one has the bandwidth for it. Yeah. And what, why would you leave? You know, you're in Alabama. And you're you God. Yeah, you're you're literally like look at Johnny Manziel. If he could have stayed in Texas A&M as long as he could have, in hindsight now, and they had NIL, he would have he would have been crushing it. Um, so I, I'm honestly uh, maybe this deserves a, a greater breakdown sometime. But like, what is the NBA and NFL going to do? Like, I'm generally curious because they have there's a chance that they'll if these donors can put up enough money for guys, which I believe they can. There's going to be no NBA or NFL team that can match rookie contracts with some of these colleges. But think about this. This is fantasy land here, but maybe we go back to like the 1984 Final Four where you had like Olajuwon, Ralph Sampson, Sam Bowie, and Patrick Ewing. Like maybe we go back to the four-year players. It won't be your top 30. Those guys might go to the G League yeah. or, or Europe or something, but like – we might have your Oscars stay four years where the, the whole the whole country gets to know about them, right? Which makes them more marketable. They have school pride. The, the tournament is even more in demand now because you got just all these fun players to keep track of. Like in theory, this could be a win-win all around. Well, it's what I want to happen. I'm just assuming that the NBA and NFL would not want that to happen. Um, but then but they'll we'll throw see. more money. So once again, the athletes athlete wins correct yeah and i'm all everything i do it's all for the athletes like i have to give all the sides but at the end of the day as long as they're taken care of i think it's it's usually a good thing um right, from, my, from my side of things. yeah it is but that the weird thing too is we're going to see how locker room dynamics change too like think about your think about how little free time you had at bu with the academics and the sport and maybe your social life. Like imagine now you're trying to negotiate deals, you know, hustle on social media, look over contracts, have business phone calls. Like, so we talk about today's generation being anxious and depressed. Like I just see that being a lot more pressure on a yeah. kid too. So what are your thoughts on that? I, I agree. There, there's definitely side dynamics that are going to play out over time. Like you talk about the player coach relation, the player to player relation, even more so the player to like academic advisor. Like I didn't want to listen to my academic advisors when I, I thought I was way smarter than them. Like they're, you know, they're just out of college. They have a low salary and they're telling me what classes to take and et cetera. Like I was like, you know, I'd listen. I'm always respectful and nice, but like in my mind, I'm like, whatever. Well, now you have a guy that's making a million dollars and someone's trying to tell him that you have to take physics. That kid's going now, nah. like he's not showing up to those things. So those are the things like these colleges. And that's where it's funny because they could theoretically, the colleges could be losing money because now alumni and donor money 
is going to shift from maybe, Hey, I want to, I'll donate 5 million for the locker room. No, now I'm going to, I'm going to give 4 million to the players and 1 million to the athletic department. Do they have the resources to like pay people to like give good advice and keep academics, but also like help it on help with NIL. I'm sure you saw Duke. They literally signed Duke. They signed a GM. They signed a general manager. Like, I don't think people understand like how crazy that is. Like they literally signed like a pro sports team. Like they're a general manager to manage their team and their, their client negotiations and their money. Like this is pro sports. Like it's here. It's right now. Like Duke literally just did it yesterday. And people are like, Oh yeah, cool. Female, you know, GM for Duke. No, you're missing the whole, the, the real story, a GM. Yeah. So that's Let, wild. Let's get off this topic for a second. I saw in your bio, you played tennis varsity. Uh, three years in high school you know most kids specialize nowadays just in one sport like tell me uh the benefits you got from playing another sport because that ultimately took time away from you doing basketball work so did that help you in a way or did it hinder in a way yeah yeah I played tennis um because my mom played tennis in college uh she was the good athlete of uh my dad played d3 basketball and my mom played d1 tennis um but uh she was just always like hey I'd love you to play tennis and just try it and I tried it my sophomore year and it was honestly the perfect getaway because basketball would usually end like we'd usually go far in high school so like February like late February early March and tennis would start and it was just like a nice decompress where I was staying active playing tennis but taking like a little break from basketball where I'd still be shooting and doing all the stuff you have to do but it wasn't like I could go play a competitive game but it was in tennis and uh it was fun and it serves me a little better now that I probably play more tennis than I play basketball. But, uh, it, it was just a good, a good escape from a little just burnout. And that was usually right before AAU went full force in April. So it was always good just to like ease that in a little bit. Um, and I would miss matches for basketball and stuff if there was AAU. So it was, my coaches were all cool with that. Oh, that's good to hear. But I've heard that tennis is a great complement to basketball because hand-eye coordination, lateral speed, um, and having to figure out, you know, how to do things without a coach or a teammate out there. So you, you learn mental toughness as well. Did you see that translate at all to your basketball? Oh game? yeah. The, the biggest thing was definitely the, the one on like, cause usually you have a team. So even if you know, you mess up, like someone drives by you and you're like, Oh, it's my fall in basketball. In tennis, a ball goes by you, like it goes by you. Like you can't say, oh, there wasn't help side or there wasn't back side or someone should have blocked it. Like, no, you just didn't make the play. Um, so that was good. And then more so I had like kind of an unconventional game just because like we're tall dudes and we just come in and we don't know tennis. I serve, my serve was bad. I had no backhand, so I'd run around everything. But I just usually run to the net because I was long and could get everything. So people hated playing me because they were used to, they were usually like really good players. Cause I, I ended up playing on a pretty high line and uh, I was just, I could like mentally, I could get in people's head just from basketball. We're used to like trash talking and I would never like talk trash on tennis, but I would say things that, you know, Hey, your your serve, like your elbow looks like it's going off a little bit when you're in. And uh, I made it fun. Cause I like took it not serious at all, but, but I, I was okay. I was probably like a little over 500 during my three years. Okay, and did growing up in a household with two college athletes, did that help you and your brothers? Oh, yeah. How so? Oh, yeah. Well, we'd always just compete for everything. Ping, ping pong. We'd go play tennis in the street with no net. We'd go play baseball, obviously, basketball, football. We'd crush each other. The main thing was just don't get hurt. Um, and then my right. parents were competitive, so that was probably the, the, the best. That's A lot of that carries down from that. I even see that in – people I know where their parents aren't that competitive. And I'm like, the kid's probably not going to be, he's just, he doesn't have it either. Cause it doesn't come from, he's not getting that constant, like the constant instruction. Like my parents, like you just expect the best or you're not eating tonight. So. Sheesh. See, I've seen both it. ends with the families I've dealt with. Like I've seen like NBA dads who their kids are terrible. And I've seen dads who have no clue about basketball and their kids are great. So I, you know, you need to do a statistical analysis on how that turns out, but um, I don't know. That, and that's what everyone's looking for. That, that's my next thing here. Maybe you and I work on this, but I'm looking for the prescription 
to play in the NBA. And you probably know this stat. There's less than 5,000 players that have ever played in the NBA since its inception. Even one minute in a game we're talking about here. 5,000. So you and I have a better chance of getting struck by lightning oh, yeah. than playing in the NBA. Or actually getting uh, elected to Congress is easier than playing in the NBA. Um, what is that thing that those players have? Obviously, they're athletic freaks, but there's athletic people all over the world that don't make it to the NBA. There's hard workers. There's people that played in great programs, with great pedigree. But what is it that makes kids that have sometimes no parents that come from very poverty stricken situations to guys like Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, who grew up with everything they needed and then everything in between? Mm-hmm. Like, what is that thing? And my theory, Andrew, and you tell me if I'm wrong, is that somewhere along the way, those, those players got slighted, right? Whether it's, you know, like my cousin, his dad left. I'm assuming he always wanted to show him that he made a mistake, you know, and I'm sure that happens with some kids. I'm sure some players have been slighted and saying, no, you're not good enough. You're not small enough. I don't know. You know, I know Steph Curry, I think his dad said, your shot's no good. If you want to play at the next level, we got to fix it. And it was from that moment on, he took it seriously and worked on his shot. So like, once you know what those slights are, can you inject a trauma or a slight into a kid that will in turn create that drive and desire to make it to that level? I do. I have asked all these prep school coaches that have co- coached pro players, like, what's the one thing they have? And the common denominator is they will work when no one else wants to work. And they have this, like, this sickness to where they've got to be in the gym because they think someone's going to take their spot from them. So, how do you, are you born with that? Is that nurture, nature? I'm trying to crack it. It's probably uncrackable, but people are looking for that prescription. So, what are your thoughts on all that? I mean, First, it's fascinating. I love kind of questions and like diving into stuff like that. <laughs> of course you do. That's, like, that's right up your alley. There's no right answer, but there is. But at the same time, if you collected all the data points, there would be there would there would be some form of an answer. You would know, okay, this is like the height that optimizes it. This is the weight. This is like the journey of like, you know, what age they started doing blank at, if they had a trainer, if they had you know, if they go, I do think the slighted thing is huge. I think that chip on your shoulder, even you saw it with Brad, like not getting drafted, that probably fueled him for most of his NBA career. Um, it's a combination or, you know, you just, you take the two tallest people in China and you make Yao Ming. I don't know. Like there's. But there's that's different. a stat too. Like one, I think it's yeah. one out of every five, seven footers in college only make it to the NBA or one out of 10. So even if you're tall, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Even if you're a freak athlete, we, we had a guy on uh, a few months ago who was a strength coach for an NBA team. And he said he'd watch March Madness. And then a few weeks later, those same heroes from March Madness would be in their training facility doing pre draft workouts. And he's like, they just didn't have it. Like, even though they were amazing on the national stage in college, they didn't know we even close to playing at the pro level. Right. So it, it's another yeah, level. Yeah. And there's guys playing in the NBA. I've never heard of that came from who knows where, how did they make it? Yeah. So, so anyway, my uh, thing is, Andrew, can you, if it isn't being slighted, if you have to have everything else athletically and hard work, is it being slighted somehow to create that drive to where you do want to work at midnight after a long game and a road trip? Like, cause you can tell someone that, but like come Sunday morning, they're like, ah, I'm tired. I'm gonna take a break. Like, how do you turn on that thing? I don't yeah. know. It's, it's, this is my, this is my theory. This is my opus. Yeah. I'm gonna try to figure out. Cause if I can crack this code and say, Hey, Here's the book on how to make it to the NBA. It's a million dollars. And <laughs> yeah. I'm making only a few copies. You know, I don't know. It's, it's just something I like spitballing, but I think it's being slighted or trauma, but I don't know. I think, yeah, I think you're on to something. I think that plays a huge, huge piece of it. And it's probably internally slighted. I'm sure some people, if you looked at reality, they didn't actually get slighted, but in their own mind, they made up this story that they did. I know Jordan, the last dance, they, they were always kind of, talking about that and people like to talk about the Kobe's or Jordan's but they forget the uh I don't know how familiar you are with basketball like the TJ McConnell's the, oh, yeah. the the Pittsburgh guy that scored 30 points a game in high school he's really short but he plays really hard and then he goes to Duquesne and he's still really good and then he goes to Arizona and he's still really good and then all of a sudden he's the sixth man and he's making 30 million dollars <laughs> with the Pacers and you're like I, I wouldn't have guessed that but like yeah I don't know. Like, there's just some guys. It's I. I think it's the it factor too. I think you can just tell 
especially with like D1 guys. I don't, you just kind of like have that energy. They have mm-hmm. that. Like I remember watching Tyler Hero play. I played against them a few times. And like in my mind, I was always like, oh, I'm better than that kid or I can do what he can do. But at the same time, like looking back now, I knew I was like, yo, he's different. Like it's just the way he moves, his energy, his arrogance, but like in contained, controlled way and just just naturally talented and, and can just like score. Like you can kind of sometimes just like see it and feel it and, and tell it's just this like a basketball ability um, to know. But the formula, I'd love to know too. Well, let's talk about China. So China actually tries to figure out that formula to where they, they take their tall kids and just say, you're playing basketball. They yeah. take other kids looking at their genetics and saying, oh, so there's this new thing in genetics. If you do 23 and me, it'll tell you a lot of stuff. But there's also... Once they do that, you've also got certain athletic markers in there. And I had this read by a company I was talking with, and they read my 23 Me report, and they gave me a couple tips, right? So I only need seven hours of sleep a night. But my genes, some genes for some people might say you only need five hours. And some genes might say you need more sleep. You might need nine hours, right? So with that, with that being said, like you can tailor almost a person's training, right? It also tells you if you burn carbs better, fat, protein. Uh, Some people through their genetics only have to, you know, work out like 30 minutes, three days a week to get in the same shape as someone who might need to work out an hour, five days a week, right? And Olympic athletes are starting to do this now because obviously, you know, a a millisecond can separate you from glory or being unknown. So they're trying to figure out every little advantage. So I figured out I need seven hours of sleep. I'm skinny and I eat, I eat like an a-hole still. I'm skinny because carbs is my main fuel source. And I have um, I have a non-addictive personality. If you have an addictive personality, based on your genes, you can do a, a uh, uh, what's it called? A single person sport, like a tennis or a golf. Okay. If you have a non-addictive, you need to play a team sport because you might need other people motivating you a little bit more. So China now looks at these genetic profiles and goes, all right, you're this, we're going to put you in tennis, golf, or swimming. You're this, we're going to put you in, you know, team sports. And by the way, you need to get eight hours of sleep a night. You can get six. We're going to cook you carbs. You're going to eat fats. You're going to train three days a week. You're going to train five days a week. And I think truthfully too, that's also the future. So China's trying to figure out which kids are going to be in the right tracks. And, And here's another theory I've got. If Michael Phelps would have grown up in Lexington, Kentucky, he, they would have made him play basketball because he was tall. To where if I was born in Baltimore to his mom, maybe I'd have 28 gold medals because I'm 6'7", have a swimmer's body, and maybe I was better built to be a swimmer than a basketball yeah. player. Just I'm spitballing here, just fascinating stuff that's out there. But it comes back to you know these kids. Like There are probably other LeBron James in the world that just are playing football or soccer or cricket. Oh, yeah. So is it destiny? Is there luck? You know, fate? There's, oh, I think all that kind of plays into it a little bit uh, as well. Because I even think about that myself. I go, in my mind at least, I go, man, if I would have played baseball instead of basketball, because I, I was pretty good. I played up till high school. I was like looking at the kids that competition-wise that are now in the MLB or in the minors. I'm like, I, I would have easily been that. So I, I, sometimes those are fun thought exercises to go. Yeah, I know tennis I wouldn't have done anything with basketball I know what I did what about baseball or what about what if I just played hockey like I think that's always interesting stuff um I think that's something needs to be explored is that genetic the genetic outlook because if my if I did it for my daughters and I was four years old and I realized oh she's she only needs to train this much to be in shape maybe I need to put her in track and field you know or 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 soccer because she'll excel at that versus trying to put her in something that might be a little bit muddier but anyway we're going to get to the quick hitter quick hitter section of the podcast here i'd finish it up um what's the biggest win of your playing career march madness tournament you want me to explain or you want me to just just quick hit it quick explain that so that was my last basketball goal was to make the march madness tournament made it my junior year we were the last team to win in 2020 and then uh some uh some disease decided to take the world by storm and uh it never happened but that was by far it was the peak it was the peak of my career to the to the very bottom in 24 hours 
I'm sorry to hear that. I've not met anyone who was actually affected in their last game like this. So I'm sorry to hear that. That's that's a it could have been, should have been, huh? Yeah, that was my last goal playing the NCAA tournament, and it was uh, it was the one year in history it didn't happen. Did they at least announce the brackets on who you would have played? Nope. Okay, okay. Yeah, we got the banner, the ring, Patriot League champs. Yeah, you made the tournament. Well, not really. Uh, it sucks. How about the best player you ever played against? Definitely, at least at the time, Fawn Maker. Oh, yeah. uh, I know I mentioned Tyler Hero. He was good. But Fawn Maker, I played on a John Lucas camp with him when he used to do those. And this was, like, right when he was, like, the star stud on all the mixtapes, seven foot, can shoot threes. The next Kevin Durant, um, we played on the same team, so I was just throwing him lobs and stuff. It was, it was cool. He was really good at that time. And, you know, then, like we mentioned it, once you get to the NBA, though, it's a little different. Yeah, my wife as a filmmaker, and she was doing some project for Adidas, and she was filming like Zion, Emmanuel quickly in like Milwaukee. And next thing you know, she texted me a picture of her and Thon Maker. I was like, oh, yeah, he's huge. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, what's your What are your hobbies when you're not doing what you do? For sure, I love I love the golf. Now I know it's still a sport, but I'm actually going to once we we hang up here. I'm gonna. Go throw some, throw a hat on, throw a belt and tuck the in shirt and, and go shoot. I don't know, probably play like 11 holes or nine holes. I won't play a full round tonight. I don't have time, but I'll uh, head over. Okay. And then what about your favorite movie of all time? Over to the court, Interstellar. Um, I love Interstellar. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's an absolutely incredible, makes you think. Uh, movie um yeah like that one that i can't even put anything number two it's just interstellar number one great movie it's probably my top 20 but i saw that by myself i'm glad i did because I, I i got a little it was getting a little humid in the theater my eyes might have missed it a little but that, that <laughs> christopher nolan can do almost no wrong so yeah yeah all right uh your newsletter you've got a lot of a lot of me put out there and if people if you want to have them read one that kind of get them started, which one would you recommend uh, they dip their toe in first with? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good question. Um, I, I put, I kind of have in the about section about seven or eight articles that I think are, are pretty good. And there's one like why athletes are jumping into venture capital, breaking it down who they are, why they're doing it. That's a good one. There's a piece on NIL and Adidas and how they're approaching college athletes and then college athletes and NIL uh, those, the, anyone in those about sections, honestly, all the articles I try to write, my whole thing is right. If I don't feel like I have something good, I won't put it out. Um, so honestly, if you read any of them, they should be good. And then I do, a, I do like a self podcast on Sundays. So like sometimes that pe trips people up like, wait, what is this? It's just, I can only write three stories a week, at least now. Uh, and I, there's a lot of things I'd love to break down further. So I just get to talk about them a little bit on Sundays. Awesome. And where can people find you? Petcashpost.com. And then on Twitter, at Andrew Petcash. Perfect. Anything else you'd like to share today? Not too much. Check out Prep Athletics as well. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hit me up if, you, if there's like a story you want broken down or something interesting. Um, I'm always... As you, as a content creator, I guess it's what some people call me. I'm always looking for things, and a lot of things pique my interest. Luckily, well, I have stuff pop in my head all the time. I'm gonna start sending it to you and just you, you should. Take it cool. If not, I have I have people. I have no clue who they are. I have their email, and it's like you know, the savior six eight seven at yahoo.com, and it's like yo, you should write something about this, or they'll forward me articles they find interesting, and I'm like, thanks. Like sometimes they turn into real things, so. I, uh, those are always helpful. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us in the podcast today. You shared, uh, just so much good Intel here to at least chew on and think about, uh, I don't know if we answered the questions as much as, you know, put out more, more questions, but I cannot recommend your newsletter highly enough. Um, if you got I've forwarded so many people in my life, um, that just, it's not strictly NIL. It's about the business and sports world kind of marrying together and you breaking down the facts in an easy to digest way. So thank you for doing this and sharing this. And I'm excited to follow your progress and see what other fun stories you have. But um, we need more people like you kind of breaking down 
how these NILs work. Cause when you see a kid makes a million bucks, well, there's more to the story than that. There's a breakdown of how that 101 million gets to the kid and how much is taken away from it, et cetera, et cetera. So I love what you're doing. Uh, you're doing a great job for people, at least educating them. And I, you know, I appreciate sharing your content. Thank you. Thanks for having me on Corey. It's, it's been a, it's been a pleasure for sure. Thanks for coming on. So that's been this week's episode of the prep athletics podcast. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms or go to my YouTube channel and subscribe, subscribe there. Uh, prepathletics.com is where all the info you need to know about prep schools is on there as well as my contact information. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for Andrew Petcash uh, joining us today with his knowledge and we will see you again next time. Thanks so much.